You know, most churches have trouble finding guys to be on the worship team. That's all you have today. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. That's really cool. That's really cool. When it was first set up that I'd be joining you again today, the first words out of Pam's mouth were, is Lynn coming? <laughs> right. So my wife Lynn is here. If you've not met her, please do before the day is over. She doesn't always get to travel with me, but it's not so far from Overland Park. So it's really good to be here. Today I want to talk about a book that we don't hear enough about. It is a book that has, it's a book I love. It is a book that's had a huge impact on my spiritual life, on, on my theology. And, and of course, the book I'm talking about is Leviticus, right? I, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, yes, <laughs> finally, right? Right? No, okay. All right. If the doors are locked, you can't get out. You have to stay. No. Leviticus is, is the first book usually studied by a Jewish child, and often the last book studied by a Christian child. This book is an amazing book, but I call it the graveyard of good intentions to read the Bible straight through. <laughs> right, we start off in Genesis. In Genesis, there's creation and God speaking to, to people, and, and, and there's murder and nudity, and there's a flood, and then there's a patriarchs. There's, there's captivity. There's the selling of a brother into, into the, slavery, the slave owner's hands, and then there's captivity in Egypt. It's just a great ripping story, page turner, and you get to Leviticus and it keeps going. There's Moses and, and him growing up and being placed in Pharaoh's household. Chapter 3, he meets God in the burning bush and he says, I want you to, to set my people free. And then plagues and miracles and escape in the Red Sea, Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments, the Golden Calf, and then the second half of Exodus. There's a do-it-yourself manual on how to build a tabernacle. which I don't really need, do I? And then Leviticus. Leviticus comes and there's goats and entrails and the lobe of a liver. I didn't know livers had lobes, but apparently they do. What you can eat, what you can't eat. This is clean, this is unclean. There are priests, there are certain there are holidays. And then, then leprosy, two whole chapters on leprosy. And I think, well, how's that applicable to me? And we get stuck in the mud. Of Leviticus, all the rules and regulations, and it seems like the same sacrifice is described five times. And the reason it seems like the sacrifices are described five times is because they are described five times. But why they're described five times actually matters. But I love Leviticus because it is so much more than a book of rules and regulations. And I claim that we, we really can't fully comprehend the cross of Jesus Christ without a grasp of Leviticus. That we can't even really understand the Christian life fully without some grasp of this fantastic, wonderful book. And so, with that, let's pray and dig in. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to, to focus on your word together, to ponder together. And to see what amazing things you have left for us in your word. Guide us now, Father, as we, we learn about not just what happened way back then, but really what matters to us today most finds roots in Leviticus. So help us, Father, to see what you intend for us to see in this book. And we pray for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's dig in. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1. Turn with me in your Bibles. Don't worry, we're not going to read every verse. But I will read the first one. Now the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. What tent? We begin in this tent, so let's find out about this tent because it matters what this tent is. Let's, so let's, let's do an overview of, of Exodus really, really, really quick because we're going to end up at the end of Levit Leviticus right here on the doorstep of this tent. So Leviticus, the first 18 chapters, there's Moses and the escape from Egypt. 
And then Exodus 19 through 24, the Ten Commandments and several other laws are given. And then Exodus 25 through 30 is that blueprint, that do-it-yourself manual on how to build a tabernacle. But let me read from that section, Exodus 29, 43 through 46. I will meet there with the sons of Israel. Where? This tabernacle he's talking about. And it shall be consecrated by my glory. By what? By God's glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve as priests to me. Who? Priests at this tabernacle. And I will dwell among the sons of Israel and will be their God. Why build this tent? So God can dwell among his people. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So this blueprint of this tabernacle comes with this great purpose statement of what the tent of meeting is, why the build a tabernacle in the first place, which is what Leviticus is going to tell us about. In Exodus 32 and 34, the, the golden calf sin, the second giving of the Ten Commandments, and in the last section, 25, or excuse me, 35 through 40, those chapters of Exodus, is the narrative of building the tabernacle. So you get the instructions, and then you get the telling of them actually doing it. But the last five verses of Exodus, let's get that up on the screen. Verse 34 of chapter 40. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. What is the main feature of this tabernacle, but the glory of God among his people. In the tabernacle, in the tent. The, the where, the what, the who, the why, the purpose of it all. And Exodus ends right there and deposits us on the doorstep of the tent that's filled with now the glory of God. This tent has now been built. So what do we do with it? That's Leviticus. That's where Leviticus begins. And so I'm going to have a little bit of audience participation today. I'm going to break up into four different groups. All right, so it's kind of red copro and forward. You're group one. Everyone on that side, the rest of the way back, you're group two. This whole section here, you're group three. And you're group four there in the back. And I'm going to have an assignment for each of you. And I'm going to need you to be nice and loud. But this first section, you're all going to have a key phrase. So you need to memorize that phrase, and when I point to you, when I ask you, you're going to repeat that, that key phrase for the rest of us to hear. And the, the, the offering section, let's get that up there. The offering section, chapters 1 through 10, your key phrase is, just as the Lord commanded. That's your phrase. So, you ready to practice? All right, offering section. Just as the Lord commanded. Nice and loud, very good, thank you. Chapters 1 through 7, and we're going to fly over the whole book pretty quickly. Chapters 1 through 7 are the offerings. Let's get that up there. Thank you. Leviticus 1, 1 and 2 establishes this key pattern in Leviticus. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, speak to so-and-so and say this. Speak to the people and say this. Speak to the priests and say this. Speak to Aaron and say this. This pattern, 30 times in Leviticus, that's how it begins. The Lord sp spoke to Moses and said, Moses, tell these people these things. And so the first five and a half chapters, 1, 1 through 6, 7, it's to the people. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, say to the people. So 111 verses, we start off talking to the people, not to the priests, but to the people. Exodus is, or Leviticus is not just for the priests. Then the next section, the next chapter and a half, 6, 8 through 7, 39, now it's to the priests. Moses, tell the priests the following things, 62 verses. Way more verses to the people than to the priests begin the book of Leviticus. And we get the first two repetitions of describing the sacrifices. There'll be five. 
The first one is the people. This is what you're supposed to do, people, with, with the sacrifice. And now to the priest, here's what you're to do with those same sacrifices. And that's why it seems repetitive is because it is, but it's saying to the people and then to the priest what to do with the same thing. Helps us to understand Leviticus to see this. And there are six times, types of sacrifices, or three kinds and six sacrifices. You don't need to write this down, but just know this exists. There's the, the worship sacrifice, which includes the burnt offering, the grain offering, and the peace offering. Then there's the forgiveness offerings, the sin offering, and the guilt offering. And then there's the ordination offering for ordaining the priests. So describing all these six sacrifices. And the last two verses of these seven chapters, chapter 7, verse 37, listen for the key phrase. This is the law of the burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering, and the ordination offering, and the sacrifice of peace offering, which the Lord commanded Moses on Mount Sinai on the day that he commanded the sons of Israel to present their offerings to the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. Offering section, what's your key phrase? Just as the Lord commanded. Good, good. Then we're going to have some examples, some good examples, and then some bad examples, two good examples. And all of these examples are pairs of brothers. They're compared against each other. And the first part of the good example, the first good example is Moses chapter 8. Now remember, back in Exodus 28 verse 1, and maybe I skipped reading that, I can't remember. But there are six names mentioned back in Exodus. It said, then bring forward to yourself your brother Aaron, that's two guys, Moses and Aaron, and his sons with him from among the sons of Israel to serve as a priest to me. Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and Eleazar, and Ithamar. So six people, two, three pairs of brothers. Those other four are Aaron's sons. We get back into Leviticus chapter 8, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and the bull of the sin offering, and the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread, and assemble all the congregation at the doorway of tent of meeting. So, verse 4, so Moses did just as the Lord commanded him. When the congregation was assembled at the doorway of the tent of meeting, Moses said to the congregation, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded us to do. And now we get the third repetition of those same sacrifices, it's the narrative of Moses actually doing them. So the first part, people, here's what you're going to do. Priest, here's what you're going to do. And now Moses actually doing it. That's the third repetition. But the key phrase there, twice he says, just as the Lord commanded. So here are the instructions, what I'm commanding you to do. And now Moses does it, just as he was commanded to do. And so now 11 times in just 36 verses, that phrase shows up, just as the Lord commanded. They did this, just as the Lord commanded. They did this, just as the Lord commanded. This phrase shows up in Exodus and Numbers as well, but there's a really high concentration here. It's key to this section. Moses is following chapters 1 through 7, and it's our first positive example. And what makes it a positive example? Offering section? You're kind of slow on the take on that one. Caught you off guard. Be ready. Let it be a lesson to the rest of you. That's why it was a good example, is because he was doing as the Lord had commanded him to do. Now, the second positive example, Aaron, chapter 9, his brother. This is the second one. And now we get the fourth repetition of the same sacrifices. Now, Aaron is doing it as the new high priest. Again, that's why we see those sacrifices so many times. And this phrase, just as the Lord commanded in chapter 9, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, verse 10, verse 16, verse 21, it kind of matters, because they were doing just as the Lord commanded. Remember, this tent was for the purpose of God's glory. That's what Exodus said. And now we have a priest. His name is Aaron. And in chapter 9, verse 6, And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded you to do, so that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. And then verse 22, then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them, and he stepped down after making the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. When they came out and blessed the people, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. 
Then fire went out from the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell face forward. The glory of God among his people for the first time. What's the whole purpose of the tabernacle? The glory of God among his people. Right, offering section? Very good. More ready that time. Okay, two good examples, now two bad examples. First pair of bad examples, those two sons of Aaron we mentioned before from Exodus, Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans. That sounds pretty good. Now they're starting to be priests. Now they're taking on with their father and kind of going into the family business, so to speak. But there's something wrong. Rest of verse 1. After putting fire in them, placed incense on the fire and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. Key phrase. Don't skip that. Don't miss that. And the same fire that came down and consumed the burnt offering now came down and consumed those two brothers. The same fire. And it was harsh. And it was immediate. And what's the difference between those two sets of brothers? Just as the Lord commanded and just as the Lord had not commanded. And as God establishes a sacrifice for the first time, there's an immediate lesson about the sacrifice. And you can almost hear God saying, I'm not kidding. Next pair of brothers. Eliotar and Ithamar, the other two guys from the six we saw in Exodus. More sons of Aaron. And they also didn't do as the Lord commanded them to do. See, they were, they were commanded, they were, they, they were supposed to eat part of the sacrifice that they were offering, and, and they were supposed to by law, and they didn't do it. They decided not to eat it, but burn it instead. They disobeyed what God told them to do. Now, they had every right to eat that meat. They also had every right to burn it, according to the law. So two more people who didn't obey what God said, but they didn't get consumed by fire. Why the difference? One right on the heels of the other. You see, they, they saw what happened to the brothers, or stepbrothers, or however they were related. See, Nadab and Abihu, they were careless and sloppy. And they, they didn't offer with what they did because of the fear of the Lord. But these two brothers, they didn't eat that food because of their fear of the Lord. They were afraid of God in a healthy, reverent way. They had the fear of the Lord, which is what the law is supposed to really produce in you anyway. That's what God wants to happen in us. It wasn't perfect. They didn't do the exact right thing. But they feared God, and that's why they did it. And they still did something allowed by the law. And it says, it seemed good to Moses. He, he saw the difference, and he said, okay, it's not, that's, that's not great, but this is not something that it, they did out of sloppiness. They didn't disrespect the offering. They respected the offering. They didn't fail to fear God. They feared God, and that's what God wanted to produce. So not ideal, but certainly not worth the fire coming down. So don't make the mistake that Leviticus is legalistic that he just wants us to obey the rules. He wants to create a fear of God in us. That was the difference. So three pairs of brothers, good examples, bad examples. All right, review, offering section. Good, all right. Next section. This is the purity section. So from this Redicop row to that and beyond, including Rick, your phrase is, be holy, for I am holy. You guys ready? Now, there are fewer of you, so you need to be louder. All right, so purity section. All right, one more time. Purity section. All right, be holy, for I am holy. Good, let's get that up there. So you have 11 through 15, five chapters on different kinds of purity. That's the whole topic, different kinds of purity for these five chapters. Chapter 11, food. 
Why is some food clean? Why is some food unclean? How do you become clean? How do you make food clean? All about the cleanliness of food, chapter 11. Chapter 12, the cleanliness related to childbirth. And chapters 13 and 14, purity and, and cleanliness related to leprosy, those two chapters. And chapter 15, cleanliness according to the body, about the, the human body. All about purity. But the tone of this section has a key phrase. And that key phrase is in chapter 11, verses 44 through 45. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy because I am holy. And you shall not make for yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth. For I am the Lord who brought you out from the land of Egypt to be your God. So you shall be holy because I am holy. Twice he says it. There's the offering section and there's the purity section. Why five chapters on purity? Because God is pure. Why five chapters on holiness? Because God is holy and you should be holy because God is holy. And these are laws how to be holy, how to be pure. In chapter 16, the day of Yom Kippur, or day of atonement, and now we have instructions back to the priests. This is the most somber day of the Jewish calendar, Yom Kippur. This is when sacrifice is made for all sins, even those that are rebellious. But it starts with a reminder of Nadab and Abihu. Isn't that interesting? They're going to start this most serious day describing it with a reminder. Remember what happened to Nadab and Abihu when they didn't take this seriously, when they were sloppy, when they were careless. Remember that, as I'm about to tell you, this most somber day. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. And so on this day, the, the priest would be one priest chosen by lot, one a year, on one day a year, he would purify the altar, purify the Holy of Holies, purify himself, purify the people, all because of sin, impurity. He had to clean all that because it was impure. This is the purity section, so how do we purify these impure things before this most somber sacrifice? They were unholy, but God is holy. So what do we do to purify this purification rituals because there's a lack of purity. What's our key phrase, purity section? Good, thank you. Yom Kippur is about being holy because God is holy, but let me add a phrase. Be holy for I am holy and I am the one who makes you holy. See, all this is about God making them holy, not them making themselves holy. Be holy, for I am holy, and I am the one who makes you holy. Now, this phrase could be the phrase for all of Leviticus, but it certainly is the phrase for this particular section. And this phrase is repeated in what was read earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. Be perfect, for your Father in heaven is perfect. Or also in 1 Peter 1.16, be holy, for your Father in heaven is holy. Verse six, or chapter 16. Leviticus, repeated in the New Testament. Then chapter 17, the necessity of priests. Interesting chapter. Well, they're all interesting, but this one kind of stands out to me. It talks about doing the sacrifices, but it says, don't do the sacrifice by yourself. Don't do it on your own. Go to the priest. Only do it through the priest. Don't do the sacrifice on your own property. Only do it at the tabernacle. Only there. Don't sacrifice to goat demons ever. Bad idea. It says it. In the blood, don't eat the blood. Why not? Because the blood is set apart for the sacrifice. The word holy means not only pure, but also set apart. The blood is holy. The blood is set apart. It's to be used only for the sacrifice. Make it special. So only in a special place by a special person can you do this, and only with the blood, only in a special way, or don't do it at all, God says. You see, God would rather have no sacrifice than a careless sacrifice. He'd rather you didn't do it at all if you didn't do it according to his will. Why? Because he's holy. He is pure. He is set apart. 
the review offering section. Oh, wow. Thank you. Purity section. All right, very good. Third, this group here. You are the obedient section. Ironic that Dan's in that section. But anyway, we'll go on with that. Um, your phrase is, I am the Lord your God. All right, you ready? You ready? Okay, obedient section. I am the Lord your God. Very good. Chapter 18, verses 1 through 5, you'll see this phrase show up. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. Just start with that. Just say that first. You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you live, nor are you to do what was done in the land of, the, of Canaan where I'm bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes and live in accord with them. I am the Lord your God. So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a person follows them, then he will live by them. I am the Lord. Three times he sets the tone for this section. Do this. Why? I'm the Lord your God. That's the only reason. Don't do that. Why? I'm the Lord your God. That's the only reason he gives. Now, this is not the same thing as when your mom told you to say something or do something and you said why, and she said because I'm your mother, that's why. This is different. God is saying, this is what I am like. And if you do this, you'll be like me. These laws reflect my character. These laws reveal who I am. And if you follow them, then you'll know me. Then you'll become more like me. You'll resemble me. The only reason to do these things is because I'm the Lord, your God. And then he speaks to the people, verse 6 of 18, and a, a ton of laws about sexual purity in the rest of chapter 18. Then chapter 19, just daily life stuff in chapter 19. Just kind of normal daily life things, not just a special day, not just when there's a big sacrifice or Yom Kippur, but just every day, here's some things, some laws about that. And this phrase, I'm the Lord your God, in chapter 19, verse 2, 3, 4, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 25, 28, 30, 31, 32, 34, 36. About 16 times in one chapter. I think it matters. That's the reason to obey me, even in the daily life stuff. For example, uh, verse 37, you shall keep all my statutes and all my ordinances and do them. I am the Lord. And then chapter 20, some abhorrent things to the Lord, cult worship, incest, homosexual practices, that kind of thing. And again, for the same reason. Chapters 21 and 22 to the priest, and the same thing. Now he's giving commands to the priest, and the only reason he gives to the priest in this section is, I am the Lord, your God. And now we get the fifth repetition of those sacrifices. But now there's the reason, because of who God is. Verse 22, chapter 22, verse 31. So you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. Verse 32. And you shall not profane my holy name, but I will be sanctified among the sons of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, makes you holy. Who brought you out from the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. And again, chapter 23, the feasts. There are seven annual feasts. And he reminds them to do these feasts. Why? Why do all these seven feasts? Because they will remind you of me. They will remind your kids of me. Uh, let's look at uh, 2343. So that your generations may know that I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. In chapter 24, verses 1 through 9. The oil is supposed to be continual. There's supposed to be a, a constant fire with the oil. It's supposed to be tended all the time, 24-7. Why? To remind them that the sacrifice is continual, that God is continually there, but especially um, that he's the Lord their God. And then the rest of chapter 24. It's a very strange part of Leviticus. It breaks into this weird narrative. 
all these laws and all these reasons, and now suddenly this story. But the story is about what if, what if somebody from outside Israel comes to become part of us, and they're, kinda, they're going with us, they, they want to attach to us, and they blaspheme. Do these same rules apply to them? Will they be punished like you'll punish us? And God says, yes, chapter 24, verse 22, there shall be only one standard for you. It shall be for the stranger as well as for the native. Why? For I am the Lord your God. That's why. So if you're going to attach to people of my name, then you will obey me because I'm the Lord your God. All of this to teach you that daily life, the worship of God is daily, not just on one day a week, one holiday a year or seven feasts. He is the Lord, their God, of their daily life, not just the sacrifices. All right, let's review. Offering section. Dude, you're the best one today. Way to go. All right. Purity section. And the obedience section. In unison. Wow. That was good. All right. Last section back there. You are the redemption section, the last three chapters. And your phrase is this, they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Let's get that up there. All right, redemption section, are you ready? Here we go. Make, make them ashamed of how badly they've done. Make real, real loud, all together. Redemption section. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. Oh, I'm proud of you. That was good. That was good. So chapter 25, the sabbatical year and then... The, the year of Jubilee. So every seven years, don't farm your, your land. Trust God instead. Take a rest. Let the land take a rest. Don't farm it. Trust God. It's a good model for pastors, by the way. And then every seventh seven-year period, so that 50th year is the year of Jubilee. And that's the year when you can redeem the land. If you sold your family land, that's when you can redeem it back and get it back into the family. If you, if you sold one of your family members out to, to slavery, their version of slavery among Hebrews, then you could buy them back out of slavery. It's redemption. So if Dan's here 49 years, give him two years off, okay? <laughs> All right. But the theme is redemption, the, uh, the idea of buying something back. You've lost something, something's in bondage, and you buy it to free it and get it back to set it free. Set the land free. Set the slaves free. Why? God says, I redeemed you. I brought you out of slavery from Egypt. I'm bringing you to the promised land to set you free. Chapter 25, verse 38. I am the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. Why have redemption? Why have these weird, weird rules of redemption? You be my people. Verse uh, 55. For the sons of Israel are my servants. They are my servants whom I brought from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Redemption section. Remember back in Exodus when he said, that's why I'm going to build a tabernacle. I'm going to dwell among them so they can be my people and I will be their God. But it gets more intense in chapter 26. This is the blessings and the curses. God begins to go through and, and say, this is, what's going to happen if you are faithful to the covenant? And what's going to happen if you're not faithful to the covenant? And first he says, well, here's what's going to be faithful. You're going to be blessed. You're going to have uh, peace in your borders. You're going to have lots of children, lots of fruitfulness. You have rain in every season that you need it. It's going to be wonderful blessing, and, and you're going to be treated well. Verse 11 of 26, moreover, I will make my dwelling among you. Moreover, I will make my dwelling among you. All those blessings are great. You know what's really great? I'm going to be among you. I'm going to be your God. That you, my soul will not reject you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out from the land of Egypt so that you would not be their slaves. I redeemed you to, so you'd be my people. I set you free. I bought you. You're mine so that you'd be my people. The real blessing is not lots of crops. The real blessing is not lots of kids. The real blessing is not just peace at your borders. The real blessing is being treated as God's people. 
that's the best blessing of all. So if you obey the covenant, you'll be my people, and I'll be your God. But what if you don't? What if you're unfaithful? That's the rest of the chapter. And he, he describes all the knots. You won't have peace at your border. You won't have a lot of kids. You won't have all the rain you need, etc., etc., etc. You won't. It'll be now. What's the worst curse in in this chapter? It's not that you'll have enemies at your border. It's being treated as if you're not God's people. That's worse. It's not just the absence of the blessings, but you will be treated as if you're not my people. And if you remember the prophet Hosea, he named one of his kids, Loami, not my people. That was the curse. Leviticus says, you're not like other nations. I redeemed you. I bought you. You're mine so that you would be my people, and the curse will be I'll treat you like you're not my people. I'll treat you like everybody else. But then it closes with some hope. It closes and said, even if you're faith, faithless, I will be faithful. Even if you do walk away, I will never break the covenant. Verses 44 and 45. And then finally, the last chapter, vows and tithes. This is an unusual chapter as well. But it's about setting things apart for the sacrifice, setting things apart for God, and then you can redeem some of those things back. So it's still about redemption. And these are the rules of how to do it. There are some things you can't redeem back. You can't redeem back the firstborn bull. You can't do that. But there are other things that you might have dedicated to the Lord that you could buy back. You, you put money in the temple treasury instead and you get your thing back that you, you vowed to the Lord. And everybody wins. You can redeem those things back. Just like God redeemed his people. So he's letting them do the thing that God did for them by redeeming things back. Leviticus is about more than just rules and regulations. Leviticus, Leviticus is about being redeemed by God. Being set apart as his people. And this is one of the reasons why I love Leviticus. Let's put that up there. All right, I'm going to do a review. So let's get the four squares up there. All right. You ready? You know it's coming. All right. Offering section. <laughs> Good. All right, get that up there. Purity section. Very good. Obedience section. Redemption section. Good. And there you have it, Leviticus. Now, at the risk of oversimplifying Leviticus, but there's a kind of a basic way to look at Leviticus. It's not the only way, but I think it's a very helpful way. You have the main flow, you have the main ideas, you have the main phrases and why they exist. And, and for me, Leviticus is like a first date. Those awkward first dates. You see, for 400 years, the people of Israel were in slavery. And they didn't really know God. They didn't really know him. They didn't know his attributes. They, they, they didn't, they, all they had were stories of the patriarchs, the people who were already dead. They had those stories, but they didn't really know God or anything about him, really. And it wasn't until Exodus 3, when Moses met God at the burning bush, did they even learn what God's covenant name is. They didn't know his covenant name until then. So he's kind of an unknown God to some respect to them. And then... We have Exodus. We have the, the, the release from slavery and the Ten Commandments and the tabernacle. But until now, all they had is just stories. And so the last half of Exodus, all of Leviticus, for the first time, Yahweh, God, begins to reveal himself to the people for the first time. This is what I'm like. All these rules reveal my character. Here's my covenant name. These are all the things about me because he wants to have a relationship with them that they didn't have before. And so Leviticus is like that awkward first date. They don't know each other that well. And God's introducing himself in Leviticus. It's the first real picture they have of the nature of God. He's holy. And he's not kidding about being holy. And all these laws are about 
introducing himself. It's a picture. These are not just rules about a tabernacle. This is revealing who God is. Leviticus is about God and his pursuing love. He didn't have to do any of these things, but he did all of these things. He gave all these things to Israel so that they could have a relationship with him, so that they could be his people and he would be their God. And in Leviticus, God says, I am the Lord your God. I am the one who is holy. I am the one who sanctifies you and makes you holy. I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. I am the one who redeems you. I brought you out of slavery and set you free. I'm the one with a pursuing love who did all of this so that you could have a relationship with me. And therefore, because of who I am, offer me these sacrifices in the right way and you'll get to know me. This is just our first date. Be holy and you'll get to know me because I'm holy. Obey my commands and statutes and you'll get to know me. You are my people and I am your God. Get to know me. I don't read Leviticus and go, wow, look at all those rules. I read Leviticus and say, wow, look how much God loves us. He provides for a relationship with us. And I love Leviticus because Leviticus paints a picture of Jesus. Just look at this list and think about Jesus. The gospel says Jesus is Lord. The gospel says that Jesus came to be the sinless and holy sacrifice. The gospel says Jesus imputes his righteousness on us and makes us holy, and that's the only way we'll ever be holy. The gospel says Jesus brought us out of bondage of sin and death, our Egypt. The gospel says Jesus brought us to set us free. He redeemed us. The gospel says Jesus came to seek and save the lost with a pursuing love. I love Leviticus because it paints a picture of Jesus and the gospel. God had Jesus in mind on every page of Leviticus. See how much God loves you. He knew he would bring Jesus. He had to make us ready to know Jesus when he came. And so we have books like Leviticus. And if you've not put your faith in Jesus as a sacrifice, God has been planning for thousands of years for us to be his people and for him to be our God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the overwhelming portrait of Jesus we see in Leviticus. How you so carefully planned for Jesus to come by, by giving us this. and Help us to not get stuck in the mud, but to see your heart, see your love, see your pursuing love for us. See you redeemed us so that we could be your people and you'd be our God through Jesus. I thank you, Father, that there's this big arc story and Leviticus is just setting up the big revelation of Christ. Father, I do pray that the, the, the awesome fear of you that the sacrifices were made to, to build into the hearts of people, that we would have that awesome fear of you, that reverence of you, and to remember the sacrifice required for our sin so that we could be your people. We thank you for not only Leviticus, but for the Christ it prepares us for. We pray this in his name. Amen.